So science is something that uh, is done by young people. I think the passion behind the discoveries, the developments presented here at TEDMED represent a lot of excitement for young people. And some of us old scientists actually were young ones. Hey, Carrie. And that's actually where we got, got going. They had dreams that we still carry. And this was actually me 40 years ago, leaving my home state of Minnesota, a Norwegian Lutheran community, heading out to Johns Hopkins to do global health. Our family had a lot of contacts, medical missionaries. These are not evangelical missionaries. These were nurses, physicians, surgeons who'd worked in the developing world. And I'm not a churchgoer. That wasn't really something I thought I would do, but I thought global health was something to be very good. And as, as a researcher, as a faculty member, things in the laboratory worked out very well. And sometimes we change our goals. And so fast forward in one click, a third of a century, here I am with students, postdocs at our lab. We made some discoveries. Life was wonderful. But a lot of the original passion was still there, and, and I must say, in many ways, unfulfilled. I thought the science was great, but I still had the hankerings for something else. The idea that we're middle-aged, you know, this term midlife, I was 54 when this picture was taken. 54, that's half of 108. It's actually later than we think. And I had consciously decided to take on some other activities, which I felt really in my heart were things I wanted to do, humanitarian activities. And that was actually uh, uh, all extracurricular, but something I felt very, very good about. Now, a special opportunity came. I, uh, in the morning, this photograph was taken, received a call from some friendly gentleman in Sweden informing me that I would share a special prize. And I was delighted. I was delighted with the news. Then they informed me there'd be a press conference in Stockholm, and I better get ready for my day, because the conference started in 10 minutes. So I hustled to the shower. And my wife, Mary, very thoughtful, very organized, took that time to call my mother back in Minnesota. My dad, a chemistry professor, had died eight years before. But mom, a farm girl with no formal education beyond high school, was very thoughtful. I think mothers always are. And when she learned the news, she said, Mary, tell Peter that's very nice, but don't let this go to his head. <laughs> and and I, I don't think she was being sarcastic. I think she was saying he still needs to do something useful. Like, how about this original idea of global health? And based on that, and, and a lot of other family support and ideas, I decided to redirect our work, and we were working in the laboratory on malaria, but decided I would like to get into the global efforts with some field work. So malaria is still a huge problem, a tre tremendously important problem, and much effort is now being directed, and there is, I think, a wave of enthusiasm throughout the scientific community and the philanthropic community that's taking on malaria. But as you can see from this map, the darkest color represents the heaviest infestations of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. Malaria is extremely prevalent. There's an industry that has sprung up around towns in Africa to make coffins because of the pandemic of malaria compounded with HIV, tuberculosis, diarrheal diseases. It's a serious issue. And who do these <laughs> diseases afflict? Pregnant women, infants, small children. Little children like these, thousands of them die every year, in sub every day, every day in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 800,000 a year. And those that survive aren't always scot-free either. Shown here is a little boy brought in near coma to a field hospital in southern uh, Zambia, where his life was saved. He was suffering from cerebral malaria, one of the most serious complications of malaria. And he's rescued, but notice he has a disconjugate gaze. It's because he's left with cortical blindness. The visual cortex of his brain did not survive the malaria. And shown to the right is a, the doctor that saved him. This is <coughs> Dr. Philip Tuma who's really, I think, a goodwill ambassador in the most profound way. Phil was born to an American me medical missionary 
in Zambia, <clears throat> grew up in Zambia and Zimbabwe, then returned to the United States for his medical training at Johns Hopkins. It's, has started a malaria research institute in southern Zambia that I'm going to tell you about. And here's Phil and his team. I'm in the green shirt. To my right is Phil. And to the left is another Goodwill ambassador, Sungano Marakura. Sungano is a Zimbabwean who left to get education at Oxford University and the London School of Tropical Medicine and has returned to Africa. His dream is to bring his expertise back to his people. And the activities have been very productive. The Malaria Institute at Matcha, something that I'm very proud to be affiliated with. And due to the generosity of the American taxpayers in the form of National Institutes of Health grants and generosity of individuals such as Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, who made very, very generous gifts, this work has been very effective. And in addition to the laboratory work, there's a lot of field work because the parasite is constantly evolving. The mosquitoes that carry the parasite are becoming resistant to insecticides. So the whole co notion of malaria is, is a very plastic concept that if we continue to do things as we're doing them now, we'll run out of tools. And of course, the patients that develop malaria live in the outback. This is, a, this is the road to a village that we visited. This is at the beginning of the rainy season. The grass is just starting to grow. It'll grow about eight feet tall. It's hard to get back there. But back in that part of, of rural Africa, you have many little domiciles such as this, where the field station people will investigate for carriers of malaria, because the silent carriers are the reason the disease always comes back. It may kill many children, but those that survive may get it again and again and become carriers. And here is a family that we visited. Despite their kind of solemn nature, they're very grateful for what we did. They're very, very kind people, but these are very poor people. These are amongst the poorest on the planet who live on, a, on an earnings of less than $2 a day, but they're very religious. They have names like Moses, Miriam, Isaiah. They also have names that are really interesting, Love More, Precious. I met, I met an individual named Never. I asked him, how could you be named Never? He, says, he was the youngest of nine children. His mother said, Never more. <laughs> and some of them are named Philip. Philip after Phil Tuma. So the work of the Malaria Institute has been very successful. This bar graph indicates the decline in the prevalence, 98% reduction in a decade. 98% is not 100%. It's still out there. And the part of Africa we're working in, the former colony of Rhodesia, is split now into two, Zambia in the north, where malaria is coming under pretty good control, except for on the north, adjacent to Congo, in Zimbabwe in the south, for which uh, great problems have emerged due to the economic decline and the social dysfunction. Zim and Zam, as we call them. And of course, these are carried by mosquitoes. Malaria is coming under control in southern Zambia, but not in Zimbabwe. Mosquitoes don't stop at the bridge. They'll cross right over from Zimbabwe to Zambia. So the problem will come right back. In Zimbabwe, we've been working recently because of uh, Sungano and his, his uh, great presence being a Zimbabwean. It's a beautiful country with beautiful people. But malaria has come back in great abundance. This is a clinic where we're working in the eastern Hande Valley in Zimbabwe on the border of Mozambique. These nursing staff, and Sungano is on the back, but the nursing staff work 24-7, 365, and they can't keep up. So there's real, I think, reason for great effort in malaria. Now I'm going to tell you another story, and this is a story about extracurricular activity I've been involved in. And this is as part of the Center of Science Diplomacy at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Two individuals there, Vaughn Tarikian and Norman Newrider, I'll show you their pictures have initiated this wonderful science diplomacy program, taking scientists to countries like Cuba, Myanmar, Burma, Syria, and North Korea, countries which are adversarial to the United States but are welcome to science. And the concept is simple. Shown here is a Carl Zogby poll. This is the year after the invasion of Iraq. Notice 
five mo moderate Arab nations, their view of the U.S. in general. Only 11, 4 to 11%, 20% have a favorable impression, with nearly 90% unfavorable. But when the United States Science and Technology was presented, and the same individuals responded to the poll completely differently. They like our science. They like our technology. And this opens doors, doors for all of us, to places where our elected officials are totally unwelcome. So I'll tell you briefly about a trip I just, just made to, to North Korea. I got back the week before last. And of course, North Korea, as we know, is the last Stalinist state, the Hermit Kingdom. Raise your hand if you've been to North Korea. <laughs> Very few. I saw one hand. We're not welcome there. But as scientists, we are welcome there. And a scientific delegation, actually, this delegation was a year and a half ago. I'll tell you about that. Then I'll tell you about the recent trip from the American Association of the Advancement of Science. And in the far right is Von Tarikian, a young geophysicist who is head of the center. So Pyongyang is a lot like the Twilight Zone. It looks real. It is real, but something doesn't feel real. And of course, the leaders of North Korea, the dear leader, the current leader, and the, his father, the, the great leader, are everywhere. Their likenesses are everywhere. And the people are constantly called to work hard for their country, give everything for the country. And yes, military comes first. But there's a culture in North Korea of individuals who are very proud of their Korean heritage. And there are scientists in North Korea. I'll show you some of the pictures. But the leaders are all showing this emblem, this lapel pin, the likeness of Kim Il-sung, the great leader because this is pervasive in Korean society. They're plant biotechnologists because they understand and they freely acknowledge they cannot feed their country. It's expected that six million people in North Korea may face starvation in the next year. And so they're using new, new biotechnology, they're trying to raise crops to feed the, the people. But it's a very difficult situation with a government which is uncooperative and unwilling to acknowledge the need this gentleman I'd like to tell you about, because I, I consider him a friend. He's the director of the International Center of the State Academy of Science of North Korea. We spent a week together, got to know each other pretty well. While driving south of Pyongyang, there's a large arch called the Reunification Arch. And at this site, I asked him, because the road 100 miles further would be in South Korea, have you ever been? He'd been to Africa, he'd been to Europe, he'd been to South America. I asked him, have you ever been to South Korea? And with sadness in his voice, he said, no, that is still not possible. So near, but still so far. And at the end of that trip, having a meal together, he shared with me a story. His grandson, who's six years old, lives with him and his wife. And when he told the grandson that he would be spending a week in a hotel with Americans, the boy, he had a stern look and concern on his face. He said, grandfather, bring the rifle. Because <laughs> Korean, North Korean children are raised with the idea that we are the evil aggressors. They fear us. But he shared the story with amusement. And at the end of the trip, I had a, a box of granola bars left over, snacks I brought just in case I got hungry. So I gave them to I gave, I, I gave this individual the box and said, please give this to your grandson. Well, a year later, when we met at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia, the State Department has allowed us to invite the North Korean scientific leadership to the United States for discussions. This gentleman, I'm not telling you his name because of reasons that are pretty obvious, sat across from me from the table and, as expected, issued a stern warning. The follow-up from the last trip has not been satisfactory. We are disappointed. I'm sitting across from him, so I, 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 first thing that came to mind, I said, but what did your grandson say? Did he mention the rifle? And he couldn't keep a straight face. He smiled. He says, no, he said, bring home some candy. <laughs> Maybe that's what science diplomacy is, one person at a time. We were informed by the Chinese foreign ministry on entering North Korea the first trip that we would be successful in our mission. And they encouraged us because of the notion that the Chinese and the Koreans are close. 
is a mis misconception. They worry about North Korea. They consider them unreliable. But they knew, they said, science may be the way in. This may be the common ground. And you'll know if you're successful if you're invited back. Well, we've been invited back. And shown here, I am with the uh, Deputy Director of the State Academy of Science. And I've given my necktie at the very end of this trip, the first trip, hoping we would be invited back. And this was the necktie I wore in Stockholm when I presented the Nobel lecture. And I gave it to him with the notion that the first of his countrymen to win a Nobel Prize should wear this necktie. And he received it graciously. So we returned, as I said, two weeks ago for the opening, or excuse me, the anniversary of a new university in Pyongyang, the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. Pyongyang University of Science and Technology is the result of a gift from a Korean-born American named James Kim. It is an English language university, the only one in North Korea. And the best and the brightest science and technology students will be enrolled there for undergraduate and graduate study. This is Mr. Kim. He's done this really out of the goodness of his heart because he wants to reunify Korea. I think science may be the mechanism to do that. Chanmo Park, former professor of computer technology at the University of Maryland, is the chancellor. And we had a very interesting time together. Shown here on the left is a young Korean-born American shaking hands with the Minister of Education from North Korea. And shown here is a banquet. The gentleman on the right with the glasses is Norman Newrider, a former organic chemist turned science diplomat, making a toast, breaking the ice with our adversaries. But the students, they come from a regimen that uh, we, don't, we don't see in this, this country. No one would describe Pyongyang University of Science and Technology as a party school, <laughs> and, unless maybe you're talking about the Communist Party. They, they march to class singing praises to the, the dear leader. They are polite, they are formal. They don't make eye contact, and it was a challenge. But after meeting with them for a week, we got to know them. And while initially the answers to questions were staged and rehearsed, after a while I think we, we, we broke through. So I've never had such an orderly audience at any university I've lectured to in the United States. But these people were actually listening. First time I told a joke in a lecture, no one laughed. And then I said, that was a joke, that's funny. They all laughed, burst into laughter. <laughs> Just like you did. <laughs> and I think after a week, we did connect. In some subtle ways, there was evidence they connected. We never saw them without their suits. On weekends, they would be cleaning the buildings, sweeping, dusting with suits. And then one day, I was passing by the dormitory in the evening, they were studying. They were all sitting in their rooms in front of the window in their jockey shorts. And I yelled up, where are your suits? And they burst out laughing. <laughs> so anyway, the story is about extracurriculars, adventures at midlife and beyond involving science and technology, but on a humanitarian level. And my wish to this young scientist here is that you follow your dreams. When you get to be at my stage of life, you look back, you think it was not only worth it, it was a lot of fun. With that, let me thank you.